The bottom end of the spinal cord down towards the lower end of the spine is called the conus. And that part of the spinal cord should be free, unattached. Anything that causes an abnormal attachment of that bottom end of the spinal cord so that with lengthening of the spine, the spinal cord gets pulled on is called a tethered spinal cord. And the significance of that is that it puts the spinal cord, the lower part of the spinal cord under stretch. And that is chronically injurious to the tissue. And it also has been shown to reduce blood flow to the tissue. The nerve cells that are in that part of the spinal cord give rise to the nerves that go to the muscles of the bladder and the sphincters and also the lower extremities. So among the things that we can see with symptomatic tethered spinal cord are abnormalities in the function of the bladder and sphincter muscles and anything that affects the muscles of the lower extremities, like in the ankles, it can also lead to a progressive curvature of the spine called scoliosis. So there are a number of different types of symptoms that can occur with tethered cord. And the most common simple so-called type of tethered spinal cord is from an abnormality in a structure that comes off the very bottom end of the spinal cord called the phylum terminale. And if that's formed abnormally, that can cause traction on the bottom of the cord. And that's what people are usually talking about when they are referring to a simple type of tethered spinal cord. The more complex types, though, are of two varieties. One is a type of complex spinal cord that you're born with. And then there's another type where it's an acquired tethered spinal cord. Things that can tether the spinal cord from birth are typically lipomas, abnormal collections of fat that have formed inside the spinal cord. And that fat is attached to the fat that's under the skin. So the babies will often have a, a lump on their back. There's a spina bifida defect there, or a defect in the bone. And the fat that's in the spinal cord comes out through this spina bifida defect and comes to outside the spine. And so that fat is anchored there and it's connected to the bottom end of the spinal cord and it's tethering it in, in that way. These are of different varieties. Some are more complex than others and they can be very difficult to treat. The other type of spinal cord that I referred to is an acquired tethered spinal cord and that's a result of prior surgery. So for instance, children that are born with open spina bifida they have an operation early in life, soon after birth, to close that. That always leads to scar tissue at the site of the original closure. And as these children grow, the end of the spinal cord is attached to the scar tissue there locally, and that is tethering the cord secondary to the prior operation. And as those children grow, the spinal cord becomes increasingly stretched and they can become symptomatic. So in a nutshell, a complex tethered spinal cord is one in which the spinal cord is bound at its bottom end in a rather complex way, either by scar or by lipoma. And the only treatment for that is an operation to release that connection and free the cord from being under tension. Complex tethered spinal cord is a fairly serious business for two reasons. One is it's highly likely to cause neurologic symptoms in a child as they grow. And also it's serious because the operation to treat it can be very complex and it is somewhat risky. A pretty good rule of thumb is if you think you can do a really good job of removing most of the lipoma and the surgery looks like it's gonna be not fraught with higher than typical risk, it makes sense to operate on those children, usually around six months of age, to prevent them from that 40% risk of having deterioration as they grow. If it's a very complex spinal cord that you don't think technically you can do a good job with and get most of the lipoma out without causing neurologic harm, sometimes it's best to just wait on those children and watch them closely over the years because about half or so will not develop any symptoms in the first 
10 or so years of life. And so another way to handle that is to watch them closely, and if they start to get symptomatic, then proceed with surgery.